Praise God for bringing in the next generation. Someday we'll be gone, and without the next generation, the church will disappear. I've uh, seen several churches go that way. Open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this uh, day you've given us, Lord. Lord, thank you for the time you've given us to, Lord, just, just worship you, and thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. Lord, just continue to guide us in your ways, Lord. And Lord, let us keep our eye on you and only you, Lord. And just to do your will. In your son's precious holy name, amen. amen. Title of this morning's sermon is, Thy word is a lamp unto thy feet. Which is actually the first, uh, it's the first Bible verse I ever learned in vacation Bible school. First Baptist Church in Belton. It was a great way for mom to get rid of us for a week um, that's why we went to church is <laughs> so mama could get rid of us <clears throat> you know Sunday mornings mom get rid of us for the whole morning uh, we rode the rode the church bus um, praise God that as an adult that uh, my children came to know the Lord and are members of a church now you know, there are, uh, this may surprise you, but there are an estimated 6 billion copies of the Bible in print. Yep. Over 6 billion and more printed every year. And uh, there are only about 7 billion people on the planet. So you'd think by now almost everybody would have a Bible. But uh, in those figures, um, some people have several Bibles in their home. More, more than one. In fact, the Bible's been called the best-selling book of all time. The sad part is it's also the least read. Psalms 119, 105. I'm going to start with my favorite verse. Thy word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. In Matthew 22, 29, Jesus replied, You are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. And in Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Jump back to the Old Testament, Psalms 119, it says, Thy word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. So it kind of sounds like there's a lot of emphasis on the word of God since there's so many verses attesting to the fact. But we've got to ask ourselves, how do we value the Bible? The answer in our words and our daily practice might vary. The answer might depend on how often do we read it? How often do we study and meditate on it? Ask yourself, what is the selling price of the Word of God? You see, men sell by whatever they value something at. So what's the Word of God actually worth? For 30 pieces of silver, Judah sold his soul. Not Jesus Christ. He sold his soul. Remember Lot's wife? There was something hidden in Lot's wife's heart somewhere. Deep love or hidden desire or lust. There was something going on in there. There had to be more than just a look over the shoulder. There had to be something behind that she desperately missed for some reason. And today, many people sell their Bible time for other commodities like fishing, golfing, riding your motorcycle, you know, other activities that we feel are important to us. And if these other activities are more important to us than God, then it might be a problem. You know, we did the Bible study, God's at War. Anybody remember doing that one? If you haven't, I'm sure we'll do it soon. It's powerful. It talks about how anything we put before the Lord becomes our God. It becomes our priority. The same thing with, with the Bible, the Word of God. If some other priority comes before it, then that's our God. That's more important to us than the Word of God. So if you're too busy for the Bible, you're probably too busy. Today our churches are becoming weak and anemic. Because what we study are like the TV preachers, the newest book that comes out by Joel Olstein, 
some video on YouTube we find. We read great books by great men, great women. We read books about great people from the past. But I think the problem is we might be killing the move of the Holy Spirit by studying everything but the Bible. Now, I'm not against any of those other things. I'm not against TV preachers as a whole. I'm not going to point anybody out in particular, but as a whole. TV brought Billy Graham in at just about everyone's home. So you can't really be down against that. However, our priority still has to be the Bible. It has to be the Holy Word of God. There's a saying that says, Sin will keep you from the Bible, and the Bible will keep you from sin. It's almost a Yoda saying, really, if you think about it. One thing I want everyone to take to heart is if you read your Bible and you take it to heart, it will scare the sin and hell right out of you. I promise it will. If you read it. You know, we've seen over the years whole ministries go under. Churches close. Churches defeated. Because so many of them have strayed from the Word of God. You can build the church on professionalism, educated clergy, talented musicians. By the way, we still need to talk about a praise and worship team. Well-trained leadership, seminars that we go to, and the, the, the glitter one that the ladies went to, there's so many out there. Ones with powerful, motivational speakers we listen to and we get all giddy and excited when we hear what they got to say. You can post all the happy, inspirational, feel-good stuff you want on Facebook, our chat group, Instagram, any other form of social media I don't know anything about because I'm old. But without the Word of God, we've got nothing. One recent survey suggested less, of, less than 30% of religious leaders read their Bible daily. Less than 30%. So how can we have sustained growth and reach the world with social gospel? Let's take a look back at David in the Old Testament. I like David's character. David's character is proof that anybody can uh, be in God's will. <laughs> One thing you see a common theme in the Bible of some of the great leaders is they were all broken or had issues, just like each one of us. You see, David failed God miserably. He broke the commandments. In fact, he broke the very heart of God. See, Nathan came by with a message from God. And in the first part of 2 Samuel 12, 9, he says, Why hast thou despised the word? Or taken lightly the word of God. Down in 13, David admitted, he said unto Nathan, I have sinned against God. So how did David correct his failure, correct his problem he had? David penned these words under the anointing of God in Psalms 119, 10, where he said, Thy word I have hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against God. You see, the word of God did a work inside of David's heart. The word brought about a change. A change we could probably all use. The word of God also birthed something deep down in David's spirit. In Psalms 109.4 he shared, But I have given myself unto prayer. And how do we share his word? Well, what God needs is a vehicle of truth. He needs somebody to share it. There's a lot of scripture in this, folks. Don't wear your pencil out. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they not hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God. So how can the truth be advanced if it's not known? How can we share the word of God if we don't know it? Look at today's society today. We've got guns in our school, school shootings, nightclub shootings. Now, guns are not the problem. 
When I was a kid in Texas, every high school pickup truck had a shotgun hanging in the back window. Nobody said anything. Sexually transmitted diseases are running rampant today. Over 80% of the world's population has some kind of sexually transmitted disease. Divorce is cursing our nation, dividing our homes. Why? What has changed from 20, 30, 40 years ago? Today's society does not know the Word of God. We need a revival in the world, not just the church in the world. A revival that will turn the hearts of the people toward the Word of God. And before it's too late, because we are running out of time. We are running out of time. Once there was this uh, young preacher, and he asked this old man of God, how many times have you read the Bible through? It has to be a lot. The old man bowed his gray head and said, you know, I don't know if I've ever read my Bible from cover to cover, but I promise today I'll start. You see, he wasn't the Word of God. We're straying from the Word of God and people are doing things like counseling. Not downing counseling, but at best, counseling for all the ills of this world is a Band-Aid. We have to hear a cry from within the church. The Word of God or death. Because that's the alternative. Eternal death. Now don't get me wrong. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with good programs, 12-step programs. I got clean and sober because of a 12-step program, so I've got nothing against it. However, I would have come to the Lord a lot sooner if that program had been submerged in the Word of God. I like the program Thad's doing here to reach the lost and reach those who are struggling with addiction because God's involved in it. What good is it to get clean and sober if you're going to hell anyway? I'm just saying. I know people that got clean and sober in AA. I do. I know people that got clean and sober in AA and died not knowing God. Now, I'm not suggesting you don't know God, you keep drinking and drugging. I'm just saying the Word of God is important. How many times have we said to ourselves, you know, people have said, I can't memorize a Bible, it's too hard. <laughs> do y'all know that in the Old Testament, that the Jewish people, the Jewish rabbis had to learn the first six ver uh, books of the Bible by memory? That's a lot of these and thous and those for those of you today. But they had to learn it by memory. I guarantee you some of you know every single word to some commercials on TV. We're there, we've seen it, we've covered it. There's one, don't squeeze the Charmin. What was that like, like in the 70s? You know? Mr. Whipple's lucky he didn't go to jail for like today. You know, he kept squeezing that Charmin without Charmin's permission. <laughs> that's totally not right. But that's just an example. I mean, how many of us can recite lines to movies? <laughs> I'll raise my hand. Nick and I have had whole conversations in movie lines just for fun. <laughs> How about some song from the 70s or 80s comes on the radio and you remember every single word, even if you ain't heard that song in 20 years, it just comes right out your mouth. I bet you can even remember what one person said about another person to you. Bet you can remember that. But we can't quote the Bible? Is it laziness? Lack of value? Why? Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So can I suggest that maybe it might be a lack of priorities? How is it our children don't know the Ten Commandments, but they know Pokemon or SpongeBob or Spider-Man? Monty was talking to me the other day. We were talking about... Uh, little Easter egg when he sits up here with the children and, and, and asks the children about Bible verses and different things in the Bible. And he commented on how sad it was that so many of the children didn't know any of it. Any of the basic single stories in the Bible. Why? They didn't get it through osmosis. Somebody has to tell them. We have to tell the children. 
We have to tell our children about the Bible. We can't sit around and expect society to do it. I mean, poor Dana back there, she's on fire for the Word of God. But she could get fired for sharing it at school to children. How sad is that in this world? There's a saying that says, read the newspaper to see what man is doing, but read your Bible to see what man ought to be doing. I heard of one old preacher one time that he said, I fear that everybody picked up their Bible and blew the dust off it at one time. We'd have a total eclipse of the sun for a week. <laughs> dust on the Bible is dust on God's holy word. Remember this for a moment. The devil fears no dusty Bible. Not a single one. Many people read, don't read the Bible because they think it contradicts itself. How many of you have had that argument with a non-Christian who says, what, yep, there you go, it contradicts itself, it contradicts itself. It says here, it says here. That's not why they don't read it. They don't read it because it contradicts them. And they don't want to hear that. <clears throat> Most people are going around looking for sweet, happy meal sermons. You're not going to find those here at this church. We're pretty honest. The only sugar you'll find here is for your coffee back there. Maybe a cake or cookie at potluck. Thank you, people. <laughs> they want to hear something that just makes them feel good. You know, I'm, I'm not picking on any TV pastor, but so many of them are popular and have a huge audience because they tickle people's ears and heart, and make them feel good about themselves inside. Some of them are preaching people straight to hell because they're not teaching the truth. They're just telling them, it's okay, God loves you the way you are. God does love each and every one of us the way we are. But he wants us to change to be more like him. So many churches want Christ to be more like us instead of the other way around. Because again, it contradicts them. It makes them feel better about themselves. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He's talking about today right now, people. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Let's not seek fables and stories in this church. Let's seek the truth. Because I want the real word of God. I could go to church feel good about myself, but what good will it do? <laughs> Dean always tells people all the time, you know, if you ask me my advice, you better expect to hear it because I'm going to tell you the truth. Because a real friend will tell you the truth, whether it hurts you or not, because they want the best for you. A fake friend will tell you what you want to hear to make you feel better about yourself. Or that stupid joke, you know, if you commit a crime, I'll be right there with you to back you up on that. It's not a real friend. A real friend would say, I wouldn't do that if I was you. That's a real friend. And we've got to be real friends. <laughs> the Bible is the only book that has the Word of God in it. It's the only book that we may know our future. It's the only book that answers life's questions. Where did I come from? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Where are we all headed? All of that can be found in the Bible. The answer to every question you have is in the Bible somewhere. You just have to look for it. <clears throat> a little short story for you, and I'm going to ask you a question at the end. It's going to be, what's the difference? You ever play that game, what's the difference? They do that on Sesame Street, for those of you old enough to remember Sesame Street. There's a man named Max who lived in New York, didn't believe in the Bible. He thought the church was full of hypocrites and liars. So he never attended. He never took his children to church. We were talking about genealogy earlier. Now, he had 1,026 descendants. 300 were sent to prison for an average term of 13 years. 190 became prostitutes. 680 were alcoholics. 
Many to this day still live on the welfare system and haven't contributed a thing to society. Now, in contrast to that side, there was a man named Jonathan Edwards who lived in New York at the same time. He read his Bible daily. He loved the church. In fact, he and his family were in church every single Sunday. Now, he only had 929 descendants. 430 became ministers of the gospel. 88 were college or university presidents. 75 wrote a book. Five served in the U.S. Congress. Two became senators. And one of his descendants was nominated as vice president for the United States. They weren't on the welfare system. They didn't cost the state a single penny. They were serious contributors and tithers to their church and to our nation. So I ask you, what was the difference? Anyone? The difference was the Bible in church. His family was in the Word of God. You know, any fool can prove the Bible isn't true. But only a wise man can search through it and believe it. You can find anything to make it not true. Wise men seek the Son of God and the Word of God. However, in this day and age, there are many people who have misused the Word of God. Just like they've misused politics, the justice system, our Congress, our Senate, our government. How many of you know what the separation of church and state was really about? All right, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, the separation of church and state was meant to ensure that there was not a national religion. It was because in Europe the Catholic Church became the religion because the king said so, and that's what you have to do. That's why we have the separation of church and state. It has nothing to do with tearing down a hundred-year-old cross that commemorates soldiers who died for this country. It has nothing to do with everything the government's trying to say. Nothing. We have misconstrued and twisted the Bible in society today. You know, the Bible is not your spare tire when you have an emergency. It's the steering wheel for your car. You know, so many people reach out and grab a hold of it when they're in trouble. I have. Lord, if you just don't let that cop find out I'm drunk and just give me a speeding ticket, I will never do this again, Lord. Just be there for me, and I promise I'll never do it again until next weekend. <laughs> How many of us have done that? Amen. <laughs> I have a lot. Psalms 119, 105. You don't have to write this down again, Barbara. We said it earlier. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So remember this. The darker the night, the greater the light. Shine as lights in this perverse world. You know, there was an old thing where Bibles were placed under the pillows of the dying. Anybody remember that or heard of that? They used to place, yep, Dad heard of it. They used to place Bibles under the pillows of the dying. But the problem with that is we need to keep it in the hearts of the living. Placing a Bible under somebody's pillow when they're dying might be too late. Maybe instead of sticking that Bible under the pillow, you should tell them about God. Regular books in our library or Google, that's just for information. The Bible is meant for transformation. There's a, a poem that says, listen closely. I'd read this twice before I got it, actually. I'm imprisoned by bars of bone. I know to do good, but it seems evil is always present. The Bible is a door out of this prison, and I can see eternity. Bars of bone. What he's talking about is we're in prison in our own bodies. And the only way out of this prison is the word of God. <laughs> but again, many twist the word for private use. Second Peter 1, 20 and 21 
says, No prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. You see, there are those that would warp and twist the Word of God. Even add to it. Some people add to it. Now, some people take it away. And I've used this example before in sermons, but it's one of my favorite verses that has been misconstrued and twisted. Who's ever heard a man tell his wife, the husband's the head of the household? <laughs> Most misconstrued verse in the whole Bible. I'm the head of this household. Delusional. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Sprocket just got married. You understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, Genevieve, you might be waiting for me. <laughs> but it, it, it's true. They, they warp it and twist it. I tell, I tell the story Dean and I did a marriage counseling to a couple, and that was, his, that was the only verse he knew in the whole Bible. And he only knew verse 23, 523 in Ephesians. Husbands and head of household. Husband and head of household. Now today they're not married, they're divorced. Why? Because he just couldn't grasp verse 24 and 25. That says you have a responsibility to be the spiritual leader of your household as Christ is the church. Mm -hmm. He couldn't grasp those other two verses. Right. He just held out to the one. There are hundreds of verses in the Bible that are misconstrued. I knew a guy once that uh, there was a verse that talks about how they took a tree and cut it down and decorated it, made an idol of it so he didn't believe in Christmas trees. They, amen. He got it. Jeremiah 10. Kind of dumb, but that's what people believe. You see, you never graduate from the school of the Bible until you meet its author face to face. Amen. That's when you've learned it. You know, there's a picture going around the internet. It cracks me up. It's a photo from a bookstore of the Holy Bible, and they slapped a sticker on it that said, Autographed by Author. If you run across that one, oh, buy it. You better buy that. Okay, I was just being goofy there, but it's true I did actually see that. You see, the Bible is God's gift to us. It's his legacy. It's what he's left for us to learn from, to live from. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, here's the harsh one, for correction, for instruction, and in righteousness. Amen. And it's all out of love, even the correction part. D.L. Moody once said, I know the Bible is inspired because it inspires me. Did you know you're the only Bible many people will read today? In other words, we have to be the living word to the lost and the dying. We have to be the love, the hope, the peace, the joy. And these things reign within the pages of the Bible. But we can't do it if we don't know it. I don't want you to say, do I have to? I want you to say, because I want to. Because I want to know the word of God. Because I want to be close to the word of God. You see, love motivates our giving and our duty to our fellow man. But we're limited by the lack of knowledge in God's word. You can do all the feeding the homeless you want. You can do all the helping your neighbor you want. But without the word of God, what is it? It's just a good deed that won't get you in heaven. So would you agree with me today? To make a commitment to read and study the Bible? Amen. To grow in the Word so you can share it with other people? Yes. Let's not let His Word be useless in our lives. Let it be useful to us so that we can be useful. Amen. That's why He gave it to us. Remember, every question, every problem you have is addressed in that book. Everything. Everything. You just have to read it. Because God, his word, is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. 
He lights our way. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the word you've given us, Lord. Lord, I just uh, ask you to put a check in our spirit, Lord, to want to read your word and uh, know more about you, Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we're doing a Bible study on Wednesdays where you, we're getting into your word verse by verse, Lord. And Lord, I appreciate what you're teaching us through that, Lord, and what we're learning from it, Lord. Lord, I know that every time we get into your word, you tell us something different, something we need, something that we can apply to our lives, Lord. I just ask that you just give that stirring in our spirit to read the word, Lord, to know your word and to share it. Lord, guide us and direct us in your ways, Lord, and be with us as we travel throughout our day, Lord, and travel throughout the week, Lord, and let us be a, a light shining in this dark, perverse world, Lord. Yes using the word, your word, Lord, to share the message with others so that may, they may know what we have in our hearts, Lord. I ask this in your son's precious holy name. Amen.